As for the, the epidemic or the, uh, the pandemic, um, as much as it is uh, disturbing through all of the pain and suffering that I see is happening, I believe it's a gift to humanity in a certain way because we were headed for over the falls and the epidemic, the pandemic has pulled us back from committing ourselves to self-destruction. Um, again, the vehicle of our self-destruction is a gonzo economic system that was forced upon us a hundred years ago when JP Morgan instituted neoclassical growth economics as the only thing being taught in the preeminent business school of that day. Stuart Scott is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Stuart refers to himself as an eco-social strategist after working a conventional career with assignments for IBM, Merrill Lynch, and several universities. In 2008, he gave up working for money and since has devoted himself through a series of volunteer staff initiatives to awakening humanity to the ecological and climate catastrophes that our growth economic system is creating. His latest effort is an initiative called Facing Future with a video channel at facingfuture.tv and a web presence at facingfuture.earth. Stuart Scott is also a good friend and we've known each other uh, since Al Gore's Climate Reality Project, but we worked together for Climate uh, uh, Matters TV when I, I, I came to assist him at one of the COP conferences, COP 23, I believe it was. And well, it was the one that they, that Fiji was the host, but they yeah, did it in COP 23, Bond Fiji. Yeah. Perfect. It's so good to see you, Stuart. Same here. Same here, Mark. Thanks for being time. on the show. And I, I, I almost hesitate to ask because I know and I, I want my listeners to know. Um, but please feel free to only tell us what you want. I, I want to ask how you've been doing, but I know it hasn't been the easiest road, and especially during this hard time of the pandemic. How have you weathered this time? Well, there are two different questions there. Um, I've got cancer, and I've got a, an insidious kind of cancer that's metastasized from my bile duct. I think it's from being too stressed out at all the cops that I, that I, I went through uh, by myself before I got help from people like yourself. And, um, and it metastasized up and down my spine. And uh, so it's, it's a difficult one. And, um, but I, I've got excellent care, uh, both conventional care with uh, chemotherapy and, and the uh, health uh, natural care uh, through a series of things. I'm throwing everything at it uh, possible. And I'm, I'm happy. I'm so glad. All I can say is I'm happy every day, uh, losing a little bit of weight, but eh, I was always skinny. As for the, the epidemic or the, uh, the pandemic, um, as much as it is uh, disturbing through all of the pain and suffering that I see is happening, I believe it's a gift to humanity in a certain way because we were headed for over the falls and the epidemic, the pandemic has pulled us back from committing ourselves to self-destruction. Um, again, the vehicle of our self-destruction is a gonzo economic system that was forced upon us a hundred years ago when JP Morgan instituted neoclassical growth economics as the only thing being taught in the preeminent business school of that day, which was the University of Chicago Business School. Um, and you, you can find it in the history books. It was called the neoliberal coup. 
And then all of the universities around the world ended up copying. And so now we've got simply the word economics, which is a, a cover for what I call a Ponzi scheme, which is growth economics that benefits the banks. And, um, and it's destroying, it's throwing humanity under the bus. And bankers are powerless to change it. They're trained with all the rationalizations that it's the way to go, but they're powerless to change it because if any of them step out of line and say, hey, we gotta stop growing, we shouldn't fund the destruction of the Amazon, then they'll be replaced by another growth ec economist. So the system is self-healing in the wrong way. Now I, I've unloaded my no, major- No, that's perfect. Uh, uh, to start with. So wherever you want to go with it from here. No, that's uh, perfect. That's exactly what I want to know. And you've opened up some nice uh, pockets there. There's uh, m many um, cross pollinations or groups that we're affiliated with. We're both on the planetary emergency group with the club of Rome and, uh, and, and you um, let's put it in the nice term, you call bullshit. If there is something that is wrong or you don't agree with you, uh, it doesn't matter who it is. You, you come out and you really t uh, give the honest and your honest views and opinions and try to get people on, on the straight path. And I love that about you. You've always you. been that way. And you're, you're dedicated, not only the way you, you interview people, the way you bring them, it's, it's, it's beautiful. But that in, in Climate Matters TV, you've had Dr. James Hansen, you've had Greta Thunberg, you've had um, a, amazing professors, scientists, doctors, educators, and people in the climate movement, but also protesters. And you could probably tell us a lot more, but, um, and a lot of religious leaders as well, um, yeah. uh, very high up. And so you- Very important uh, part of the puzzle yeah. is the, the, the spiritual, aspects of humanity and I, I deal with those by bringing religious leaders and and sp people who are are shall we say associated with the secular religions of earth humanism yeah uh, and you don't have to believe in a, a god or a deity or uh, buddhism which believes not in god or deity but in mind but it has a transcendental factor. And, and my synthesis of the problem, what was going wrong back in 2009, my, my epiphany was that humanity through the secularization of society has come to the point where we have an emptiness inside, okay? Where society created this emptiness because we're not encouraged for many people, we're not encouraged to feel okay that we have divinity within us, that we're okay, we're complete. And so we've been trying to fill that void with stuff, with the stuff we own, with the stuff we do. Um, and the advertising industry is more than willing to jump in and help us fill that void with if you, if you only buy our razor blades, then you will be yada, 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 or drink our beer and, and you'll get a girl like the one in the background of that advertisement um, staring at you. And um, so we've got, we've got a problem is that we are, we don't realize we're okay at the way we are. And one of the gifts again, that this pandemic is giving us is, is giving us the opportunity to appreciate what we've got. We're stuck at home, we're stuck in a limited, and so we have to appreciate that. Yeah, sure, it'd be great to be able to get back to large parties and, and uh, you know, traditional family gatherings, but the opportunity to see how we're getting by on so little, how our real essential needs are so circumscribed. And we've got all this stuff laid on us. Oh, you've got to have the latest iPhone or you've got to have the, uh, the, the latest 
nail polish for women or wh whatever it is, you know, social media cooperates. They, they just want to grab your attention to sell you advertising, so to sell big, advertising to you. Big, it's, consu it's big consumer ploys, and it's all about branding. And um, we actually... Before, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mark. Consumerism is the dominant religion of Earth. And I call it a religion because it has the same aspects of believing in something on the authority of others, okay? And that belief is you will be happy if you buy our stuff. And that's not true because happiness doesn't come from the stuff you own or play with. Happiness comes from inside. Yeah, it really does. And, and I'm glad that you, you really touch upon that. I want to bring out a, co a couple more things. So the last time we physically saw each other was in November in uh, COP25 in Madrid. And, yes. and, and it was uh, outside of, of your plenary room or the room you were in. Um, and you just finished uh, doing a, a session with Dr. James Hansen. And um, you, you're also kind of a little feeling a little frail, had your wheelchair there, and, and but yet still going strong like you always do. Had Dr. James Hansen there, but it wasn't the first time. You actually had had him was it two other times before yes. on the show? Um, and, and actually, um, through the uh, fortuitous coincidences, if you say it in a secular way, and if you say it in a spiritual way, through arrangements from a higher power, I, after trying for years to get in touch with Hanson, uh, and it was impossible, I didn't get any replies to emails, I was in New York at the Earth Institute on Broadway near Columbia University. And I met a friend and we were walking down Broadway to look for a restaurant to eat. And we passed one restaurant and I was drawn through the open. I said, this is the one. We walked in and it was empty. I said, let's go to the back. We walked to the back, we're sitting down and there is Dr. Hansen across the aisle talking with two young people. And so I, I said to my friend, please just stay here, don't ask questions. And I got up and I stood a polite distance away with my hands folded in front of me until he had to see me and acknowledge me. And he finally said, can I help you? And I said, Dr. Hansen, I've been trying to get in touch with you for years. And I, in, I had my 30 second elevator pitch, my opportunity. And he said, I'm very interested, but I will ignore your email unless we arrange for something in the subject line that I will note. So we put a token in the subject line and that became a relationship that we now have. And he That's will fine. be at Glasgow if I am well enough to attend. Glasgow is, again, is the, the city that the next yeah. COP will, will occur yeah. in. Next November. Yeah. And as for Greta Thunberg, there's another story there. Not only did I have Greta Thunberg on my program, by the way, it's, it's morphed, it's, it's evolved from Climate Matters TV to Scientists Warning TV, and now it's Facing Future TV. But when we were Scientists Warning TV, I was introduced to Greta Thunberg through her father, and I talked him into driving down to Poland to bring her to COP24 in, in Katowice. Yeah. And, um, I told him when we met in Stockholm where I was due to give a presentation anyhow, he came to the uh, place I was staying, we met for a couple hours. I told him I was gonna have Greta on four times so that every journalist there would have an opportunity to see her if not to interview her. So I was the one who invited Greta Thunberg to the cop. I gave her and her father badges for week one and the Secretary General gave them badges for week two. Now, when you look at the, when you watch the movie, I Am Greta, that fact is obscured and they make it seem like the UN invited her, which is not the case. If you look, you'll see them hurrying down the hall in one scene and he's saying, come on, we're late. They were late to one of my uh, press conferences, one of my 
programs, TV programs. I'm so glad you're letting us know that story. I know the story and, and it's a special way that she she got into the cops and also was on on your your episode and show which you have recorded which you still play and is getting numerous views um there is a transition uh, the other the other transition is you were on we don't have time in uh in stockholm in sweden for uh, ingmar rentholz who's actually one of the gentlemen also climate reality leader um, that we kind of know from those circle who actually was was there who went out on parla uh, to the parliament and spoke mm -hmm. with Greta and helped her in, in a lot of ways to move forward. So uh, I think our, I think our was my introduction to Greta yeah. is we don't have time made contact. He, he someone from his organization passed her the very first day she was sitting outside there outside the parliament with her sign, mostly being ignored by people. She was just sitting kind of lonely and quiet. Well, I can't say lonely. She, she exists in a world, a special world where being alone is not difficult. And, and he, he immediately went back with the cameraman and said, may we interview you in English? And they did a short interview that gave her, I, I call it, they launched her in in the booster in the first stage rocket and so she began to get interviews on the street and he introduced me to her and I brought her to the UN and that basically launched her into orbit and in that scene that I mentioned she's complaining oh I'm tired of all this daddy I want to go home I miss my dogs and he says don't worry it'll all be over in a few days you'll go home and you'll be a, an anonymous person again Nobody will, everybody will forget you in 15 minutes and how wrong he was, but she has matured from the 15 year old who was already speaking truth to elders. She was already more knowledgeable than 95% of, of the people who attend the climate talks. And now two years later, she's refined her, uh, her I hesitate to call it pitch, she's refined her, her bank of information so much that she can go toe to toe with any denier, any, anyone in the world, I would, I would hazard a guess. Uh, is it George Moffat, also Johan Rockstrom and many others have really um, helped her education, given her departed other wisdoms and, and, and uh, been a real learning lesson that not only uh, she, uh, she sought out herself um, for that knowledge, but also some great collaborations. Um, Kevin, Anderson. Kevin Anderson was a major, yeah, you yeah. can hear his voice or his ideas. And I like to, to think that I influenced her also because very soon after her appearance on my programs and every program I do, I insert my my thing about how money has come to own us. We no longer control money, it controls us, it's a meme. And she picked up on that. And so now she has integrated into her offering that it's our economic system that's killing us and the system has to change. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I, I wanted my listeners to kind of get that depth of, of some of the guests you've had, some of those you have. Those who don't know who Dr. James Hansen is, is uh, the former Goddard Institute of NASA uh, head, chief scientist. And um, he, he in, in Al Gore's uh, presentations at the beginning kind of says, you know, when I start, first started, when you first started in, in the presentations, it was 300,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs going off every single day. That's That number has since been updated to 500,000 going off every single day. And that's, that's some of the data that comes from Dr. James Hansen and many other things. He's a, he's a, a advocate for the climate. And you also had his granddaughter uh, on the show with him. Uh, the, I think it was the second time that, that he was there together with you as well as uh, I think we're trying to get Severin Suzuki as well, who uh, was suing the United States uh, and I think still is or, or, or is still going through that process. Um, Severin Suzuki is, yeah. I, I should, we should detail that a little bit more. 
she, at the age of 12 or 13, journeyed all the way down to Rio de Janeiro for the initial Rio summit out of which the climate talks sprang, the Kyoto Protocols were a response to the recognition that climate was a problem in, at the, the summit, the Rio summit. She and four of her friends raised money, paid their own way to go down to Rio. And she gave a talk that is, it's known as the girl who stopped the world for five minutes. And she gave an intervention, which was just mind boggling. It's on my channel as well. It's been listed on many channels. And if you put them all together, it's probably been viewed a hundred million times. Or yeah, more. at least it's, at the very least. Yeah, it's amazing. Why we st I still talk about her today. She's amazing. And she was just on recently on the new TED uh, com combination with the United Nations, their new release during the pandemic, where she kind of gave us an update and said she's still um, alive and kicking, still active in climate, and nothing has changed. Uh, we have to do more than double down and uh, said some very strong words. And so there, there's just a group of uh, uh, amazing people you spoke forward to, but that's not it. You've been at this for a while and, and maybe uh, you, you wanna even go back a little bit more and give us some insights of maybe how you first got into to doing events on, on uh, in the press area, in the secure zone, the blue zone of the United Nations uh, a conference of the parties, the, the COPS um, events, and then other uh, uh, United Nations uh, events that, that you spoke or have interacted in. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you initially pushed in that direction, got in that direction, and then kind of some things that you've seen and learned and experienced over the time. Okay, that's a, that's a that question kind of expands out to something I could speak for hours, but let me, let me try to be concise. Um, at a very young age, you could even say when I was in my mom's belly and they named me Stuart, it was a prescient uh, gift because the derivation of the name Stuart is steward and it's the one who takes care of the lands. The steward of the king's lands. So I have a a birthright to be the one who takes care of the land. And at a very young age, I developed that, that inclination. Uh, I, at, in my career, which spanned information technology, that is IT, and uh, financial, uh, I worked for Merrill Lynch as a, what we call a stockbroker. It's actually a, a salesman, you know, you're selling concepts, paper. Um, but I've worked in various things and it's, there's always been a thread of wanting to, to make the environmental more important. And so when I worked for Merrill Lynch, I was the first, as far as I know, I was the first environmentalist stockbroker on Wall Street. And I put it out publicly uh, at an Earth Day gathering uh, in New York. I said, this is my interest. If you have the same interest, please get in touch. And Merrill Lynch, their lawyer said, you went just about as far as you could go without getting us in trouble and you in trouble yourself. Because I was not offering information. I didn't have the information. I was soliciting interest. And I went into my boss's office. 20% of the flyers that I had turned out were returned to me with expressions of interest. That was before the internet, okay? So you had to actually clip a coupon or write your name and, e and not even email, your name and your phone number and maybe people had email addresses then. Yeah, I forget. And I got 20% back, which is beyond anything that you usually get back. So my, my manager said, that's a great idea, but you can't do it at Merrill Lynch. Why not? Because we are the thundering herd. And if we recommended one of those pure plays in environmental uh, remediation, we would blow their stock out of the water on the upside or the downside. You can't do it here. 
So I quit Merrill Lynch and I went on to that same kind of thing kept expressing itself. Whatever job I had, I was thinking, how do I benefit the planet? Finally, in 2008, I was teaching college and I decided I was going to go to the, uh, the cop. My, the, uni the university I was teaching at, or the college, it was not a full on university, was going out of business because of financial mismanagement. And I said, if I cover my classes, may I leave a, a, a bit early and go to the climate talks? They said, okay, I had to get into the climate talks. That's a story in itself since I had missed the deadline. But I made a contact with the NGO liaison who told me how to do it, even how though I worked the system. <laughs> well, she knew how. She knew how I could still get in. And, um, and I did. And I didn't know that first year I went, it was in Poznan, Poland. And I did not know what I was supposed to do, but I went with two objectives, one very specific and one very general. The specific one is that I wanted to go to a press conference that the, the negotiator for the American negotiating team would give. And I wanted to cut him off at the knees because it was the last COP conference of parties that the George W. Bush administration would control the negotiations. And the lead negotiator was an oil company lobbyist what? What? <laughs> so um, his name was Dr. Harlan Watson. And I succeeded in going to the press conference that he gave. And I was first in line at the mic. And I asked a question that did not need to be answered. I'd already cut him off at the knees with the statement of the question. What he answered, I forget. It was not important. I wish I had a recording of that. <laughs> Anyhow, the other programmatic uh, idea was I was there to help any NGO, non-governmental organization who was on the right side, that is, was pro-life, pro-negotiations. Any organization like that, I would help them in any way I could. And then I started finding ways to help and that evolved into a place where I was very well known, knew a lot of people, um, and uh, was allowed to do things, was, was told how to get around rules, how to work within the rules, to do things that no one else does. I, as far as I know, I'm the only person who's ever been given permission to hand bill at a UN climate talks. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was there for 10 seconds, the guard stopped me and said, you can't do that. And I said, I have permission from the Endo. And he called her up and he said, I don't know how you did it, but sure enough, she said, you can do it. <laughs> that's fabulous. And, and that's the, that's the Stuart I know, and I love, and I'm, I, I'm so glad that you're still at it and you're, you're, you're continuing to think about the future uh, of, further cops, especially continuing with Dr. James Hansen and other greats uh, on the show now uh, as it continues to evolve. And you, you, you alluded to it earlier, uh, but I want to go just a tad bit deeper into it. So um, this pandemic, however horrific, has been a horrific, wonderful movement for climate bubbling the, the problems to the surface, shining a microscope on things, and really uh, making a shift in awareness. And a lot of people saying they were right. Well, or, or, or we've got to change our plan. There's got to be a different system and, uh, and out there. And so when the year before the pandemic, when the year started out for me, I don't know how it was for you, but it started out as a bang. Companies, corporations, organizations, we're doing more than doubling down. They were making big ambitions, big goals, big movements, making big shifts. Um, and I, it was the decade of action, it still is the decade of action. I, and we can maybe talk about that a little bit later, but it really took off and I was like, now we've put our foot on the exponential roadmap and it, it's looking pretty positive. 
then the pandemic, and I think it was in retrospect, a very positive thing what had happened. And so that's also that question. How have you weathered this time? How has that also been with your circles and what you're working on now, what you're seeing uh, uh, moving forward? Was it a similar type of cases and stories for you? Yes, yes. Um, how I'm working with the opportunity that we've been given. And I remember one of the many things I got from my involvement with Al Gore, and I tip my hat to him, even though I feel that his, his placement in what we got is too central, that he doesn't go to the urgency, he doesn't express urgency in his tone, because he's trained to be level-headed and, and scientific, and so he can't shed a tear or, or say, oh my God, but for, despite that failure in my estimation, one of the things I learned from him was that the Chinese character for catastrophe, or I think it's the equivalent of disaster, is a combination of danger and opportunity. So we have a pandemic now, which is both a danger and an opportunity. And the opportunity is that we may emerge from this with a different playbook, economic playbook. And so how I'm working with that is, thank you, God, I've been given an opportunity through a 12 year process of courting a relationship with the Vatican, which is more properly known as the Holy See. The Vatican is just the geographic place. The organization calls itself the Holy See, S-E-E. -E. I've been given an opportunity to place an intern from the School of Ecological Economics, which many of your, if not most of your listeners and viewers will never have heard of. There are other forms of economics. And the one that I'm banking on, and I'll use that word intentionally, the one that I'm banking on is ecological economics, which was founded by Dr. Herman Daly, D-A-L-Y. And I encourage listeners to look that up. Um, when this becomes a YouTube video, we will insert clickable links to things about ecological economics but I've been invited essentially to create a conduit between the wisdom from the School of Ecological Economics and the Holy See. That's beautiful. So, so the Pope hopefully will be messaging more clearly about how we need to change our economic system in order to benefit humanity and in order to benefit life on earth because it ain't all about us. It's what it's all about is life and we are being part of life. Uh, there's a, a new David Attenborough documentary, which he says it's his testimony. He's leaving his testimony to reality, to humanity. And it's, it's alarming what he says, that he like Al Gore doesn't, he doesn't get urgent. He doesn't have that. He's very level-headed. Um, but, but he basically says, this is our last chance. We've been given an opportunity. He, he doesn't mention COVID, but we've been given an opportunity. And if we emerge from that opportunity with a different notion of how to run our economic system, then we may survive. That's beautiful. And I, I love to hear that work. And it is a, a, a huge opportunity for us not to go back uh, to normal, to uh, the new normal. This is more than the Great Reset than even the World Economic Forum is saying. And um, what, I, what I've always been saying is there's a big misunderstanding with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. A lot of people were under the impression that that they are both an add-on 
to business as usual or just an add-on to some kind of a old operating system. It's absolutely not. It's a brand new global operating system. And it's one more of exactly like you say, Herman Daly and what you're, you're speaking in ec ecological economics for sure. Um, and I, I don't know if, if you feel comfortable or not. Would, I'm sure my listeners would love to hear some, some basic concepts on ecological uh, economics. And I, I mean, I even have a question that might, is it similar to the same form of calculation that we use to calculate earth overshoot day? Is it based upon yeah. a replicable yeah. global hectare? Yes, the earth overshoot day, which um, basically goes back to uh, the, the creation of the concept of our ecological footprint. And there were two academics, Dr. William Reese, Bill Reese, who's also been one of my guests on my programs. Uh, I haven't brought him to the cop yet, but that's, that'll be Glasgow. Um, and one of his grad students, Mathis Wackernagel, and Mathis ran with it. And he, he has, uh, I forget Book the name of it. .org, I think. Yes, yes. Um, and he's the one who calculates overshoot day. That is, what day of the year have we already used up everything we should have parsed out over, sectioned out over the year? Um, that is, that's one of the NGOs that I consider a very uh, truthful, essential one. But there are many NGOs that have become part of the problem, unfortunately, because this economic system we have as a way of co-opting resistance, co-opting the dissidents. And so for instance, the Sierra Club famously cannot say anything negative about the industrial meat industry. They can't say anything about that because that industrial meat industry is one of their major sources of income. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the he lobbyists. Uh, yeah. There's, there's two. Holds the tune. Yep. Absolutely. So I mean, we, I, I do. You, you know, I do a lot around food and agriculture, and and it's uh, around the world. It's not just the United States. There's too many lobbyists that are pushing those industries uh, with the politicians that have allowed so much corruption, so much. Uh, bad um, practice and things to get in. In 2008, the entire world shifted and, and financial markets and investments to anything to do with the food systems. And at that shift, it turned food systems into a commodity. And when you commoditize food, then you cheapen food, which when you cheapen food, you cheapen life. And, and it's just a horrible down spiral ripple effect that is, right. that is so so awful that uh, you know the people who are interested in food systems now as a commodity have no idea what goes into food and how it's produced and therefore what are we going to get the cheapest food and it doesn't matter if there's you know radiation toxins. or uh, toxins right. in there as long as it's cheap but then you've cheapened life and, and you've messed up so many yes. other things in life. And, and so um, that, that, that feeds into a corrupt medical system, corrupt in that the Western medical system, again, it's, it's run by money. So if, the, if our food is creating an outbreak of cancer, well, it benefits the medical system because the, the, the chemotherapy companies are are amazingly wealthy. I, I've got cancer and um, unfortunately I don't have a mutation that will allow a targeted uh, immunotherapy, but there's one that I've been told may in 50, it's got about a 15% chance of working in, in my case, but it's a last resort. One pill, $9,000, one pill. Unbelievable. Why? Because they can. And when I went for a, my chemo infusion two weeks ago, every other week I get an infusion of chemo. 
in the arm and then they send me home with a pump that pumps the second in a little bit of a time through a port that goes down and into my, into my heart. First stop is the heart. They were going to give me a bag of this, uh, Keytruda is the name of it. Um, when I say pill, it's, they were going to give it to me in, in intravenous form, a bag. And, and the, the nurse who administers has to show me everything she's going to give me to see if my name is right. And I said, yeah, the name is, and, and birthday are right, it's me. But why are you giving me Keytruda? Is this going to cost me $9,000? And she looked again and she said, well, the doctor said to give it to you. I said, uh-uh. Now the company that owns that, I think it's Merck, they have a, a charitable arm, which will eventually qualify me to get it free. But they can afford to give it to certain people free. When, she, when I refused to take it, she said, oh, don't worry, we have several people here who are going to get it today. We'll just use this bag for one of those other people. What? And they, they were all paying the $9,000 through their insurance. So they probably didn't have to pay a penny. So the insurance industry makes out like bandits. The, the medical industry makes out like bandits. The food industry doesn't care what they're feeding you because they make out like bandits. And as you said, when a commodity that we consume becomes a matter of what is cheapest, you get everything that breaks or breaks you. You get hammers that don't last. You get light bulbs that don't last. It's, it's, it's quite tragic what money, what the playbook that money has created has done to society. Now, yeah. a solution to that, which I've mentioned several times in interviews, if we had a, a, a cryptocurrency, but instead of the chain being hidden, which protects drug smugglers because if they can buy and sell in, in Bitcoin, then it's anonymous where the money came from. If instead of that model, if the, if the, the Bitcoins that you get you could fully see who everyone who's owned it, then there wouldn't be any corruption. It would eliminate the possibility of corruption. The chances yeah. of that happening right now slim to none. Well, we don't know. We have some. We have some great people. You know, well, I, I believe it was the same. Uh, it was at uh, COP twenty four in Katowice when um, the climate change coalition was first accepted into the UN and then they started doing some actions and having some organizations or inner agencies of the UN really start to look at distributed ledger technology, blockchain. It's a late start, but now that momentum is getting more and more and hopefully we, we can come up with some emerging technology, some solutions that are really better uh, systems. Um, our, our focus, obviously, uh, and a lot of things you discuss is money, economics, as, as a lot of this corruption and, and things like that. And when we began our conversation, you, you spoke a, about neoliberalism. Well, there's this, there's this thing, and we can maybe touch upon that as well. Uh, I absolutely do not believe in neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism. I believe that it is not survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, natural selection. Uh, that is, uh, and sorry again, my French, that's all bullshit because the way our world works is more of a symbiotic earth, a, uh, you know, uh, one within planetary boundaries, we're all homo sapiens and, and on this spaceship earth together that with cooperation, collaboration with doing things together instead of in a competitive, uh, only the strong survive, survival of the fittest, severe competition. That's just not how our world works. And there's, there's some emerging um, older wisdoms that are now coming out more and more that realizing that, that our world is all interconnected and it re requires us all to work in collaboration instead of this severe competitive type of a world, but I don't know if you have some things you can add to that as well. Yeah, 
you, you, Mark, you're, you're, you're brilliant. And you, you include so many avenues that I'd like to follow up on. Um, let me first deal with a flag that I, that I sent up in my mind when you were speaking. One of the other, I won't call it a solution. I don't believe we can solve the problem in the ordinary meaning of the word, which is putting the toothpaste back in the tube. The earth is never going to go back to the stable state that it was in through the Holocene. We have entered the Anthropocene era where humanity is now shaping the ecology of the planet. It's a force of nature. So we're not going to go back with a solution. I call them interventions. And one of the interventions that I'm beginning to recommend broadly, I, every time, every opportunity, is that if we could get business schools, even one preeminent business school like JP Morgan cleverly did to insist that every business major be required to take a course in ecology and a course in ethics, that alone would transform what we were turning out in terms of MBAs. That would be a very powerful move. So I wanna say that, and that will, God willing, that will be one of the things that Pope Francis may, may be promoting through this new opportunity that I've, 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 uh, I've created. Um, now, the, the other thing, the other avenue that I want, the other rabbit hole that I, I wanted to go down for your, for your question it, it's it's a it's a, a, a rough it's a, it's a as I said it's very expansive. If not only I'm going to the the esoteric part now, let me backtrack and say what I'm doing evolved into first the interfaith declaration on climate change, where I I said at the UN meeting that faiths are all together on the, this point. And I had a gentleman on the panel who was a, a member, it was in Thailand, and he was a member of the, the broad royal family. He was a descendant of Rama V, who was the king depicted in The King and I. Yeah. And he's one of the descendants, but he's a scientist, well known. And he was on the panel. So, after the interfaithdeclaration.org, it's still there, signed by the Dalai Lama and others, many others. I made it the United Planet, an analog of United Nations, but the idea is no borders. The United Planet, faith and science initiative. Faith and science, equal partners. So moving to the faith side, and, I, and by faith, you don't have to believe in God. It's the ethics. It's the, the spiritual without being religious necessarily. Humanity needs to go through the recognition that we are all part of the same being. Not only are we interdependent, but we are the same at a very deep level. I know the Dalai Lama has a, a brilliant one minute speech that he gave. Again, I've got it up on my channel. Um, I, I recommend your listeners go to facingfuture.tv and take a look around. You'll find quite a lot of interesting stuff. Humanity has to have that realization that we are not competing for scarce resources because that will lead to warfare and the warfare that will happen next will be of, of a totally destructive kind. It will leave the earth radioactive for eons. That capability obviously exists. We need to go at this cooperatively. We need to figure out how to limit population in a non-coercive manner. We need to tell people it's not a good idea to have more than one or two children. That has to be a, a, an out front message. And here's why we have to limit population 
and we have to limit our consumption because our ecological footprint can be thought of as a rectangle with population one dimension and consumption per capita consumption the other. So the area of that rectangle is our ecological footprint. We have to limit both. We have to make humanity realize we are all in this together as humanity and we have to control what it is we want. Private planes, forget about. The plane, the airline industry is going through a contraction. The companies that emerge, I hope, will be the ones like Delta Airlines that are willing to bite the bullet and have the middle seat empty, lose the, 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 uh, the revenue. I respect Delta so much. I went from being a loyal United Airlines flyer for all the work that I had to do. And yes, I fly way more than I, than I should. God bless Zoom. And God bless that universities have realized now that they can do these conferences without anybody needing to go anywhere. And they brag about it. Well, let's just hope and pray that they continue doing that even when and if the COVID epidemic passes. I say if, because this is a clever little virus. And if it can mutate around the, the vaccines, then it'll be with us for a few years more. So it's a long-winded answer, but we have to, humanity has to realize that it is one being. We are the host for this destructive meme of money and money is killing us, unknowing to money itself. Money has no consciousness to say, ooh, I'm killing this host and there isn't any other. Can't go to deer, can't go to reindeer. We're stuck with humanity, where's the next humanity? Oh, there ain't one. Money by itself can't realize that. Humanity has to realize it and change the money and economic system by which it operates. That's beautiful, thank you, Stuart. That almost answers my, my next question that I have that I, is, a, is a very standard question. Um, I, I, I wanna ask it again, uh, regardless and, and bring it more up to, to, the, to the modern day uh, as well. Um, I love the big picture and I'm, I'm, uh, I also have that same thought and feeling as far as we're all homo sapiens and I think we should evolve into homo symbiosis as part of this symbiotic earth. Um, but I know your travels, I know uh, enough about you to be dangerous, but I want to ask regardless, are you a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without uh, nations, borders, divisions of humanity, one from another? And can you give us a little bit more insights and, and, and feelings and of your understanding of, of this concept in, especially in this year of this pandemic where uh, the pandemic's been a global citizen, food's been a global citizen, and species that travel across nations and borders, air, water, it's all been a global citizen, but we, the human beast, has been in lockdown, and we're, we're not a global citizen, and we're being divided with nationalistic fervor and divided amongst each other. Um, Give us within some more nation. insight. Yeah, yeah. The polarization within the United States is so extreme, unbelievably extreme. And we have a huge fragment of America that actually believes the trash that Trump has been dishing out. And Trump is a pathological liar. And yet he's so charismatic that he's attracted a following of millions of people who want to believe the crap that he says, wants to believe it. Nothing can convince them otherwise. The election was stolen. I've got no proof, but I know the election was stolen. In any case, the question was about global government, one world government. I believe very strongly that if we could do that, if we could have all nations submit their sovereignty 
to a world government. It would benefit us if, and as my dad used to say, it's a big if, if the means by which we governed, the means by which we authorized and implemented were correct, were proper, and it wasn't a wealthy elite that could be bought into the, that could buy their way into power. If it was a citizen directed government, I know Extinction Rebellion has a proposal out for this. Um, theirs is not the only proposal, but they are saying the government should be composed of people who are selected almost randomly and to sit on a, a panel, a council, and an advisory panel or council. Um, I feel strongly that something like that needs to happen. And if it doesn't, then I pity the next generation, I pity them. Yeah, They're gonna go through hard times anyhow. But if, if we emerge from the pandemic with business as usual, with the, the rich old guys, mostly guys, the good old buddies running the show. And it's not, I wanna say again, it's not the presidents and prime ministers who run the show. It's the central banks that run the show. And I'll quote for the third time in three days, I'll quote Meyer Rothschild, the patriarch of the famous banking family from Switzerland. Meyer Rothschild once said, give me the power to create the money of a nation and I care not who makes the laws. Yep. So yep. it's money via the central banks that controls our governance, we have to eliminate that. We have to prevent governance from enriching those who govern. And we have to keep governance away from the already wealthy, unless they are randomly drawn to be part of this citizens assembly. Now, I'll, besides mentioning Roger Hallam, who described their system to me in a program we, we published on our website, on our TV channel. I wanna mention another name, Alan Savory. Now he's not a PhD, he's not a doctor, nor am I, but PhD does not define the entire class of people who have something wise to contribute or smart. You don't have to have a PhD to be smart and pertinent. And Alan Savory and his organization, the Savory Institute, have come up with a system of governance which similarly would rely on citizens assembly. The specifics of what he is recommending, I won't go into, but you will in a few months time be able to find that on our TV channel as well, which is facingfuture.tv. Easy to remember, we are facing future. I believe there's so many um, models out there that are positively beginning to emerge, um, different economic models, different operating systems that are more of a global governance. I, um, you know, back when, when I was in, in my late 20s, early 30s, there was, you know, this big fear of the new world order and, uh, you know, this uh, a form of a global governance and even talks about the United Nations and crazy things that the UN was trying to do. Um, well, I'm, I don't know that the United Nations would be the proper organization for this global governance. I'm, because the United Nations is under the influence of neoclassical growth economics. If yeah. you take a look at the sustainability goals, yeah. 
They had to be approved growth. by the bank. Yeah. Number eight Number is eight. good jobs and economic growth. Yeah. Now they 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 cover their butts by saying economic growth for the underdeveloped nations that need to grow their economic systems to raise their populations out of poverty. And I say that that concept is a worthy one. I always like to say um, decent work and sustainable economic growth. I, there, yeah. I, I'm a big, you know, there's 19... No yeah, there no there is a, it's an oxymoron. It's, it's an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. Nothing organic can grow forever within a finite container. And the last time I checked, the earth was a finite container. Notice yeah. that the billionaires are talking about going to Mars. A, because it gets our mind off of our problems and because they fully intend to abandon us and leave us in the trash while they try to colonize Mars or other places where they can live out their lives uh, securely in, I mean, there are different solutions. Richard Branson and, and uh, Jeff Bezos, they all, there, Bezos, there's, there's they, quite they, a few. They, Jeff Bezos was the name I was looking for. They envision uh, colonization of, of essentially spaceports. Uh, um, Elon Musk envisions colonization of Mars, uh, neither of which I believe will happen within our lifetimes. And I don't believe either of them will happen, period, because I don't think, I don't think, well, we're gonna catch 22. If the conditions for that to happen persist, then humanity is, is doomed. And I don't think there will be people to fuel the rockets, people on earth to send resupply Mars. And if you've seen the movie called The Martian, where Brad Pitt, is it Brad Pitt? No, Matt no, Damon. Matt Damon, where Matt Damon gets to play the uh, astronaut who was accidentally abandoned on Mars. And he figures out how to survive until they can come and save him. Figures out how to tell him he's still alive. Um, great movie, I love sci-fi. It's a great movie. And that ain't gonna happen, okay? I can't see Elon Musk growing potatoes out of his own dehydrated fecal material. <laughs> I'm giving away one of the themes of the movie, but it's, it's yeah. a wonderful movie. So the, we have so many rabbit holes that we could go down. There are actually uh, numerous, um, in my opinion, and so gladly, so donut economics, uh, ecological economics, and many donut other- Donut economics, donut economics, um, uh, Kate Rollworth. Kate Rollworth, yeah. She's a student of ecological economics. It's Beautiful. another brand of ecological economics. And, and, and we should do a separate program where I where I describe ecological economics for you. Yeah, we're definitely gonna have to get to because there are a lot emerging. And and what I really want to say is it's it's uh, I, I think there's some models out there that we do not need to to get rid of uh, nations or cultures or even um, different political rule on a national level. But what we need to do is raise the bar, the global operating system, some kind of a global form of governance to a higher level and say, this is where we're never gonna let humanity get below this level ever again. And, and, and here's the basics covered for all humanity and the global operating system that um, would, would raise the, high, the bar higher for future corruptions or future chaos in, in a governance type of system. They're gonna have to get much more um, wiser or, or uh, uh, innovative in how they cheat or hack the system that would then affect the individual uh, individual nations or, or the humanity at the basic levels because we've raised the bar 
so high that we say on a global level, we'll not let humanity ever go below this again. And, and it's a different type of governance. I mean, we have so many problems, uh, just the US uh, politics alone and, and voting and how long it takes uh, to get someone out of office, how, to how long it takes to figure out voting and electoral college. Mm -hmm. We know that there are so many issues in there. So we, we need to save that for another day to go down those rabbit holes and to discuss those because uh, honestly, we probably each of us have a couple hours worth of, of material that we could discuss and that we should eventually dive into. Um, Kate and, and Mariana, uh, 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 Marianne Machucatu, I believe, is also another ec economist. I love Jeffrey Sachs um, and, and many others who have some, some good um, ecological economics and some other, even uh, Jeremy Rifkin, uh, some of his ideas are, are, are great. Um, that we should discuss in the future. But what, what I want to do now is, uh, because we're, we're kind of running short on time, I want to get into um, some final questions that are really important uh, for me. Uh, one is the burning question, WTF. And it's what we've all been asking ourselves this year, but it's not the swear word, even though we've been asking ourselves that as well. It's actually... What's the future? And I, I want to know from you, because I know you're a deep thinker and a big visionary, and you've thought about, you know, what's the future? And I, and I hope you can give us the, 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 the non-dystopian future uh, answer, because I know you have a dystopian one as well. Yes. Um, and for me, there's a probability. Yeah. Or the, the world, I see the future in terms of probabilities. And I don't measure them, I don't write them down. I just perceive it that way, that we are, the present moment is the trunk of the tree and the trunk sends out major branches and those major branches send out minor branches. And when you get to that first major branching and you move down one of the branches that becomes the trunk. And then your decisions are limited by that decision that you made. So. I will proceed down the hopeful future branch, the non-dystopian one, but I will have to caveat and say that I think currently the probability is that we will proceed down the dystopian one. But given that there still remains a chance that we can go for a non-dystopian future, what I see happening is world governance via the current system, the World Economic Forum, the G7, the G20, the European Union, I see one or two nations, nation states waking up and setting, setting the example by which everyone then adopts this non-dystopian future. And that basically is a decision to have an open society, to have information flow freely, to have a, well, okay, when I say that, that is non-copyrights or copyrights exist for a very short period of time. So it's not, hey, I own this for 50 years and I can make money on it for 50 years. And if I change a word, then it's, I can renew it for another 50 years. We need to get away from that to information. Human wisdom is freely exchanged. There's no need for a fair use clause because any information can be used. Well then aren't you taking away someone's income? Well, what we need is a basic guaranteed income, which is one of the things that's being discussed in progressive circles in many countries. I think Spain went to a minimum income in order to deal with the COVID crisis. So they didn't have people 
jumping off buildings because they lost their job and they have kids to support, there's a minimum income. Well, then you need to learn how to spend that income to support your family. And you need to plan on fewer kids if your minimum income is going to be, or, you know, excuse me, if your guaranteed income, I shouldn't use the word minimum, if your guaranteed income is gonna be limited, you make the choice to have one child instead of a family of 10. So if we are going to go down the non-dystopian path, then I think we need a guaranteed income for people. We need to encourage to teach ethics at a very young age so we don't have people cheating. So we don't em em emerge a society in which you can say, oh, they shouldn't get money for free because then they're going to just yada, yada, yada. They're just going to be lazy and do nothing, you know. Um, and there are people who work the system like that. There, I live in the back of a valley in Honolulu where it's where the middle of the valley is occupied by, by controlled income, uh, controlled rental uh, housing you know, that are below market rental prices so that people who don't have a lot of money can live somewhere. But I see stretch limousines parked outside of some of these houses. Now, I wanna make a caveat there. It's not because they're rich, it's because the tourists coming to Hawaii wanna be picked up at the airport in a stretch limousine. The people who, the Japanese people, weddings that are done they want to be ferried over to the beach to do the, the, uh, the schlock photos of kissing one another in the sunset. And um, they, that's why there are the stretch limousines. But it's not, not my belief that they're hurting for money. So the system is being worked. There are uh, welfare cheats. So we need to evolve a system where an education system where kids are taught at a young age, instead of being taught with, with tools like Monopoly, the game of Monopoly, I blame that for a lot of what's going on because it's, it's ultra-capitalism. It's a form of capitalism where you don't win by having more when the time runs out. You win this marathon game that can go on until everyone's broke except the one winner, the person who's got it all. What? We teach that to our kids at a young age and we are surprised at the outcome. We need to have something else. Instead of monopoly, we need to have cooperity or cooperate. I don't know how to create the noun for it. Yeah, I, I like that. Cooperative. Cooperative. Um, th that is uh, beautiful to see that you can you, uh, you didn't keep it too dystopian that you you got it into a hopeful optimistic future and, and I, I I believe in many respects that's the part of the future that we want to live in and, and those are some of the tools that we'll need to get there. These last three questions that I have for you, Stuart, are really a kind of a selfish uh, takeaway for my listeners. I want you to depart some of your words of wisdom over the years uh, to help them to uh, be better people, to, to make an impact and to maybe learn uh, some of the lessons that you learned a little bit faster. If there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their lives, what would it be yeah. your message? Thank you, thank you. The shortest synthesis I can give to the wisdom that I've gathered over the course of my life is that we on an individual basis need to learn to distinguish between what we need and what we want. Many things will fall into both categories. I both need it and want it. I need to eat and I want to eat, but I don't need to eat caviar. I don't need to have the latest iPhone. I want, maybe, I don't want, 
I pride myself on still having an operative iPhone 3, <laughs> but I can only use it as a, uh, an internet connected device because the, the uh, global cellular system has evolved away from that technology. Again, there are so many people who want the latest iPhone and that want has been created by the hooks of the advertising industry, by Apple making it seem so cool and sleek and sexy in their videos. We need to learn to distinguish between what we need versus what we want. And if you can do that, the benefit is immediately to you. And the, the follow-on benefit is to society. The benefit to you is that you get happy because then you it's easy to get what you need relatively, not for everybody in the world, but it's relatively easy to get what you need, but it's far more difficult to always get what you want. And um, I will quote the famous philosopher, you don't think of him as a philosopher, Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger. You can't, always, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you'll find you can get what you need. Yeah, my, when it was, it's real unique uh, on your answer because when I was a kid, I was raised with a quote um, that's very similar. The greatest cause of human suffering is that we, we trade what we na want now for what we need mo uh, for what we need most and long term. Um, so we make these uh, short. We don't make any sacrifices. We get the now, and it's really. Um, what we need most to survive and um, don't distinguish that. And so I really see there's some similarities there. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? <laughs> Whoa, what do I wish I knew then what I know now, essentially, right? Yeah. My personal life the everyone's got an ego each ego is different but they're all composed of the same elements just in different amounts and this is i say this through the the, the knowledge that i've gained through a particular metaphysical organization that i've worked with for many years uh, called arika a-R-I-C-A, arika.org um, is their website, but the casual visitor will not get what the Eureka School is. It's, it's difficult. You have to get into it to understand. So what I wish I knew then, what I know now, is that people like me. I grew up thinking why would they, anyone ever want to talk to me? Nobody likes me. I'm not important. Nobody listens to me. And when I exposed that part of my ego to one of the colleagues I was working with, her reply was, that's why you've gotten so well known, because you don't think anyone's listening. And so you keep shouting at the top of your lungs, even though we are listening. That's beautiful. And we are listening. Absolutely. Um, people have been listening to your message for years, Stuart. And um, uh, this last uh, year in November, when we were in Madrid, top 20, top 24, 25, 25 sorry, uh, Madrid, I was with Ava Heretic, uh, a good friend of mine, and you met her as well. She talked to you. She's actually asked about you just the other day and I says, yeah, we're getting ready to do a podcast. And, and just the moment of that, you know, less than 15 minute interaction with you, uh, it touched her life. And many people besides the Greta Thun Thunbergs or the, the uh, <clears throat> James Hansons of the world, uh, you've touched many of us and, and I'm glad that you're here and still fighting strong. I wish you tons of strength 
for your chemo and your treatments and that you get through this and that we see each other in Glasgow next November and uh, hopefully a lot sooner than that before online and that you uh, just take care of yourself. And the last question or comment I have from you is just basically um, your goodbye message to my listeners, if there's anything you would like to depart that we haven't touched upon. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. And when you said that, what came, what came to my mind was my heart. And I want to say to all your listeners, I love you, that there is space in my heart for all of you, that we are one heart, we are one being when we go to that level of recognizing the humanity in one another. So um, strange message to leave with your listeners, but that's it. No, I'd love that's to perfect. Know. They're going to be a lot going to your website and looking you up and, and I'm sure you'll get a lot of love back as well. But there's a lot of uh, a lot of people out there who really like what you do and what you've done over the years and your motivation to us all. Same to you, Same to you Mark. I, I, I really treasure how, how good a speaker you are. And I know that you're invited to conferences all the time in the old way when it was fly to a city conferences. Yeah. Um, it amazed me, your, your travel route. You actually had a shame on you, a, a yeah. footprint that was bigger than mine. Horrific, <laughs> yeah. Well, but, uh, I've but, been using well, my climate and a couple of good uh, uh, sustained cert and carbon offsetting. And then I try to do a lot with my, with the projects that I do to really uh, put a positive impact and spin and educate enough people to, to, to give back and have a good. And now what you can do is you, when you get invited to a conference, that's a fly to a city conference, you can say, please do this virtually because you're an influential person. You are one of the thought leaders yeah. in Europe, American expat. Can I call you an expat? Living yeah, in yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you, know, you so of, much, Stuart. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Because I, I have had a wonderful, wonderful time here just kind of bringing heart and mind and body together. I'll take care of myself. My intention is to live another bunch of years. You okay? will, I'm, you I'm will. Going to, I'm gonna defy the, the, the medical journals. I'm going to essentially resolve this cancer, so. Thank you so much for your time and I hope to see you very soon and um, all the notes and links will be in the show description and I will see you very soon, brother. I really thank you so much, Stuart. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.